everybody. I uh, was a research librarian for 20 years or so. And um, when I stopped doing that, I felt the need to kind of erase the, erase the board, clean my mind out. So I went out uh, in a big truck for a year delivering freight all over the West. And um, I wrote a book about that called Ode to Certain Interstates. This part I'm going to read um, here is from the 12th part that uh, is called The Most Dangerous Moment. Chaining up an 18-wheeler in the blizzard on Interstate 70 in Wyoming, the steers, the drives, and the tandems, I heard whispers of heavenly death and darkling listened half in love with easeful dying. Or lying face down in the bottom of the dry drainage ditch while the tornado roared overhead, I felt my spirit flowing with the delicious nearby freedom of ultimate quietus. Oddly calmed by the recollection that Fragonar had passed away eating ice cream, while Lennon did not perish on that ice flow in the Neva River. For death existed wherever life did, not necessarily, noticeably, but nevertheless, constantly and inextricably as an int integral part of mortality. No less where daily life was trivial and seemingly safe than where daring adventures were perilously in progress, as when driving down precipitous grades, for instance, in descending which I confess I often struggled with rising terror, since as an acrophobe forever my every nerve was alive to the vertiginous possibilities of altitude and to the thrilling similarity of steep slopes to free falling. The Y component of the downgrades vector expressing the gravitational acceleration that when multiplied by the total mass <laughs> equaled the phenomenal force of the big rig rolling downhill out of Snoqualmie Pass on I-90, Siskiyou Pass on I-5, Donner Pass on I-80, Tejon Pass also on I-5, or not exactly a pass, but still the very worst, the notorious 16-mile hill on I-17 between Flagstaff and Phoenix that dropped from 7,000 to 3,000 feet before flattening out a bit and giving the trucker a fighting chance to shift gears again or to cool off his smoking brakes. The problems being that once the massive vehicle was headed down a perpendicular pass or an interminable hill, then its gears could not be changed without grave risk of stranding the transmission in neutral owing to the enormous pressure on the drivetrain so that gear selection during the most dangerous moment at the apex of the incline determined the driver's fate until arriving at the bottom one way or another. And that even without being stuck out of gear and with the engine retarder turned on, the brake lining surface still might overheat and melt or actually catch on fire, leaving no direct braking power at all as the remorseless pull of gravity pushed the RPMs and more catastrophically the vehicle's velocity ever higher with way too much of the hill left and no other remedy available. Which along with sheer fatigue from lying about the hours of service plus running two or more logbooks to cover up these prevarications was what could have happened to that pumpkin orange cab over that was rolling southbound down from Mount Shasta City in the fog and rain after midnight and missed the curb by the Castella exit, flying over the narrow dividing strip like a 40-ton water skier shooting off a ramp onto the slightly lower northbound lanes, coincidentally broadsiding an oncoming gasoline tanker to produce an explosion so intense and a fireball so prolonged that the surface of the interstate was liquefied for 25 yards a monumental crash that I myself chanced to witness in my rearview mirrors and that I subsequently honored silently with thoughts in memoriam every time I passed the big black spot where the damaged asphalt had been patched up after the debris and the dead were removed. This one is about <clears throat> Much more recent, as my life's not nearly that exciting anymore. Uh, this is about uh, 
a, uh, or exciting in a different way. This is about uh, confluence of the universe at a couch in a hotel lobby in Portland. Quantum intimations at the Grand Multnomah. It used to be a chore to picture death, my own death, constantly I mean, but now it's natural to me, the sense the end is ever present, near, a hovering potential like a ghost in a hotel. Say this one now, the Grand Multnomah here in downtown Portland, in whose lobby I'm ensconced and pleasantly reflecting. 66, my birthday told the years just yesterday. The family has come to celebrate. I paid for them because I can. I never want to be a burden on the young. We all have suites with panoramic city views and even those who live in town are staying here a couple nights for the event. Five suites, well worth the cost. Four children and four grandchildren, one grandson newly born, four marriages among us all, one very recent, plus a very steady girlfriend. Quite the thriving family, and Grandma Hope beside me always. Not right now though, not right here where strangers come and go while I just sit. I feel like Dr. Otrenschlag in Grand Hotel. I'm on the branch while others pass, or rather in the sprawling lobby on a most plush couch. I sit and cultivate the unity of body, mind, and spirit, focus vital breath until it's so supremely soft, and clean the mirror of my consciousness so it reflects reality with minimal impediment. The Tao Te Ching has called these acts mysterious integrity. My daughter Susan calls me introspective. I protest though and insist I'm omnispective really, looking at it all, the inner, outer, forward, backward, all around. This spot is good for omnispection. It's 101 years old. Charles Lindbergh, Queen Marie, Sam Hill, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, Joan Crawford, Lana Turner, Jimmy Stewart, Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower, Elvis Presley, John and Robert Kennedy, yes, Franklin Roosevelt and Tom McCall, they all strolled past this spot where I'm installed, amused. It's registered as a historic place, which guarantees protection of its gracious beauty, the exterior, the mezzanine, this lobby where I lounge at leisure and consider. Every morn, I eat my bu buffet breakfast down in Arcady, a giant basement room with antique murals and a classic fountain. In the inn of morning light, Quixote wakes to dream. A perfect beauty always has irregularities. A flawless beauty isn't really perfect. So this building is more beautiful than when it first was built, since time has given it irregularities, such as the tiny horizontal grooves gouged out upon the marble columns. They entice me now. I wonder how they happened. Wondering and wandering, I sit. I wonder over many things. I wonder, for example, at the complicated, exquisite, expansive pattern in the underwater sand that the male pufferfish constructs to please the female pufferfish, his silent love song, this artistic fish. I wonder at how choice, discrimination, instinct, judgment, adaptation, memory, and learning, all are properties bacteria possess, although they have no brain. The same as protus. Also, also multi-talented but brainless. Sasha Pushkin told me once, a wise and learned cat is always walking on a golden chain around a verdant oak. I wonder what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. I wonder also at how Pindar traveled on the road of godliness to reach Time's Tower, ocean breezes blowing all around and golden flowers blazing. There were those who kept their souls away from unjust deeds would dwell in endless bliss. I often wonder at Kairos and Kronos, special moment and sequential time. I wonder at the quick emergence of the water molecule, the simple liquid, almost old as oxygen, was joined with hydrogen at once and everywhere, eventually filling cells, enabling life's metabolism. I wonder that the water from the creek that runs beside my house down south in New Geneva also flows beside this spot, a few blocks east at least, just four blocks walk from this hotel, the mighty river rolling past through day and night. 
My publisher is four blocks west of here. I murmur, Gloria illorum libellorum, or the glory of those little books, my work, my life, my soul, my tribute to the Carmina of Horus and the Epiniki of Pindar. These artisanal libella, published by my friends not far from where I sit and ponder, reminiscing and conjecturing. Inflamed by love for the divine, my poems climb the secret staircase. No one sees them go, and still they sit as if they're not en route to see the lover, just as if they're not approaching such a sweet encounter with the absence in the soul. A mystical experience, a journey to the spirit of the universe, which leaves one much to wonder over after finally the brain begins to dominate again. Like, what is consciousness for, consciousness, for instance? Or what was that undiscovered darkness, spiritual lumen from whose born one managed to return? Let's call God Om and say like Henry Vaughan, there is in Om a deep but dazzling darkness, inky black that's full of light, a silence full of timeless melody and timely rhythm. I wonder that two trillion cells and 30,000 genes make up my body more or less. I have a backbone I developed as an ancient fish, a mouth and anus from the time I was a worm on the sea floor. I'm huge now, having grown from single cells across four billion years. Around 500 million years ago, the oxygen from protists and bacteria made giant bodies like my own a sudden possibility. Within the previous mass extinction, I was still a little mouse-like creature, teeth as small as grains of sand. Now here I sit, become enormous, as another mass extinction gathers speed. Some 40 million years ago, the mountains rose where India collided into Asia, and the weathering of rocks increased tremendously removing truly massive quantities of carbon from our atmospheres, so global climates cooled precipitously, causing primates to evolve full-colored vision to discover leaves most protein-rich and softest in a drastically colder world, allowing me to see a couple million shades of color now, perhaps, as I relax and passively receive the light this lobby lends me. The great rift from Egypt south to Mozambique created the particulars of me, Large brain, large molars, smaller canines, walking upright, sitting on a sofa now, expressing seven million years from ape to human. Orbits, climates, ice and cold cause gathering to be replaced by agriculture, as is evidenced in every gene of every cell of me, allowing me to digest hefty quantities of milk and carbohydrates, intimating thus the settled life of innovative ancestors those growers of abundant grain, those tamers of productive cows and goats, those farmers for millennia who live in me today. I wonder most of all at quantum waves and particles. The Cherokee in me is gratified that scientists have caused the electrons to collide with protons, shattering the protons, scattering electrons deeply and elastically, revealing points of matter in a void impacted by point particles themselves in turn surrounded by a cloud of virtuals that flicker in and out of being and becoming. So I feel Cartesian race extends a losing hold and spirit flooding through our worldview once again, the mystery by which our wonder-working matter-energy reality is made. Complementarity of wave and particle behavior, mathematics of entanglement, quartet of quarks, up, down, strange, also charm, Loop quantum gravity that's background independent, vibrant closed and open super strings, perhaps in 10 dimensions. Wormholes that connect our nows with countless thins. The famed pink sock and sock not pink of Dr. Bertelman. Superposition states and quantum decoherence, spin orientation of electrons or polarization state of photons both affected by what happens to another particle an arbitrarily long distance off. Yes, maybe in a galaxy far, far away. The supersymmetries of fermions, Higgs bosons making matter possible at multa, at multa alia. I am and sit amidst the consequence of quantum fluctuations and essential nothingness. Strange, an imaginary number, number Logically absurd, a good old square root of minus one makes quantum physics possible, or quantum waves at least, as Schrodinger described them theoretically, 
serenely petting his poor kitty as he did so. Breaking symmetry is also fundamental for explaining quantum physics and depends as well on, on, on an imaginary axis using I, square root of minus one again. Though this is logically impos impossible, you multiply two negatives, you ought to get a positive by definition. What would Socrates have made of this? We think we understand a lot about reality at subatomic scale, but need impossibilities to make our system function. Oida hati uden oida, he dare say. I know that I know nothing. Flashing us his Buddha smile. Along these lines, dark energy is 70% of everything. Dark matter, 26%. Mysterious reality is deep around us and within. Completely undetectable dark matter moves through things we see, it never interacts. Dark energy resides in empty space itself, the biggest mystery in fundamental physics. Empty space is complicated. It's a boiling stew of virtual particles pop popping in and out of being in a time so short we can't directly see them. Nothingness is quite unstable and produces something always. Quantum gravity allows and may require a universe to be created out of nothing. Mass is possible because of virtual particles appearing and then disappearing in the cosmic blink known otherwise as Planck time. The structures we can see, like stars and galaxies, were made by subatomic undulations out of nothing. Written deep inside us is the birth of stars, the movement of the bodies heavenly across the sky, the origins of days and nights themselves. This lovely lobby and this comfy couch are possible because the stellar process of creation and destruction is ongoing. Any day or night, the stars explode. The wonder, wondrous universe continues, ever dying, ever being born. At least 200 million stars have burst that we might live in our quiescent corner of our spiral galaxy. The heavy atoms in our bodies were created inside stars that blew to utter smithereens once iron collected at their cores. The quantum particles made atoms, groups of atoms rendered molecules, and molecules assembled into living cells. All life forms share this ancient and distinguished genealogy. At this point, dearest Hope approaches from the hotel entrance, having finished her exploratory foray in the city. When she reaches me, I offer, spirit moves like gravity, like spooky action at a distance, at enormous distances here, there, and everywhere at once, divine love, grace, that nurtures and embraces everything, all beings near and far. She beams and answers, good to see you too, my love. <laughs> <laughs>